Okay, welcome. Uh, very pleased today to have uh, uh, Professor uh, Alan Zweibel from uh, University of Wisconsin uh, to give us today's colloquium. And uh, Alan received her undergraduate degree in mathematics at the University of Chicago and her PhD in astrophysics uh, in uh, Princeton. And she was on uh, HEO staff from 78 to 80. And it's here she said she learned enough solar physics to enter the danger zone between ignorance and expertise. I'm sure it's the latter. And uh, she was a faculty uh, member at University of uh, Colorado from 80 to 2002, uh, where she was also a, a GILA fellow. And uh, in 2003, she moved to University of Wisconsin. And uh, she's now a William L. Crowshaw Professor of Astro Astronomy and Physics, uh, the director of the Center for uh, Magnetic Self-Organization. And uh, recently, he's the chair of the Department of Astro uh, Astronomy. Her main interest, uh, research interests are in the origin and uh, evolution of astrophysical magnetic fields in stars, uh, galaxies, and intergalactic medium, and the ways in which magnetic fields affect the environment. And today, she's going to tell us more about cosmic rays. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? It's been very good. Yeah. Let's, let's see. Okay. Good. Great. Okay. I just go to view um, full screen. Okay. So um, you'll see in a moment why I call this Cosmic Rays um, 102. Um, the overarching question, which um, I'll, I'll try to address here, is how is energy partitioned between gas, magnetic fields, and cosmic rays? And this breaks down into a few sub-questions. So about one in a billion interstellar particles is a cosmic ray, but that one part in a billion has as much energy as the rest of the thermal gas, which defies thermodynamics as we understand it. What controls the cosmic ray spectrum and composition, including the electron-proton ratio? So only about 2% of cosmic rays are electrons. In solar flares, electron acceleration seems to be much more efficient. Why is that? What controls it? How do cosmic rays couple thermally and dynamically to the background gas, despite the fact that they're virtually collisionless? And finally, how do cosmic rays regulate the environments in which they're accelerated? So the plan of this talk is a brief review of cosmic ray properties. Um, I'll talk about something which I call cosmic ray hydrodynamics, a fluid treatment of cosmic rays despite their uh, collisionless nature, how that comes into being. I'll describe some recent work we've been doing on transport. I'll talk about future opportunities. Um, here I've listed my collaborators. Uh, the names in green are students, and um, I'm happy to acknowledge support from the National Science Foundation. So uh, why is this? Cosmic Rays 102, well, it's 102 years since Hess showed that the atmospheric ionization, which has been known, had been known since the time of Coulomb, uh, was cosmic in origin. So he went up in a balloon, he saw that ionization increased with height, and that was evidence that uh, the source of ionization is not terrestrial. So they called these these ionizing particles um, cosmic rays, not really knowing what they are. But in 1927, Clay showed that the ionizing flux is latitude dependent. And that suggests that the cosmic rays are charged particles deflected by the geomagnetic field. Then in 1934, uh, Bada and Swicky made the prescient suggestion that cosmic rays originate in supernovae. In 1949, Paul and Hiltner detected a pervasive galactic magnetic field through its effect on starlight polarization. And in the same year, Enrico Fermi proposed his theory of cosmic ray acceleration. So with these developments, the, the problem was really set up for us in the middle of the last century. So let me tell you a few things about cosmic ray properties. Um, here are two views of the energy spectrum. I like this plot because uh, it shows the huge number and diversity of experiments 
that work on cosmic rays over a whole range of energies. Uh, this is the ion spectrum. This is the electron spectrum. I like this plot because it's nice and clean. Uh, in both these plots, you can see this um, very slight band called the knee uh, at uh, 3 PeV, so 3 times 10 to the 15th EV. Um, explaining the knee has been uh, kind of an enduring theme of cosmic ray research. Uh, the other points to take away here are that the energy density in cosmic rays is about 1 EV per cubic centimeter, which is close to equipartition with uh, the magnetic and thermal gas energy density in the interstellar medium. And most of the pressure, most of the energy density in that 1 EV per cubic centimeter comes from particles with energies of a few GeV. So um, relativistic, but not ultra-relativistic protons. Recently, our ability to detect cosmic rays uh, remotely uh, underwent a big boost uh, with gamma ray astronomy. So uh, here are two applications of that. This is a spectrum. So the data points are the gamma ray spectrum of the starburst galaxy M82. Um, the low energies with uh, Fermi, high energies with, with Veritas. And um, the, the fits are um, Tova Yost Hull's attempt to fit this, um, this cosmic ray spectrum with a model in which cosmic ray acceleration works as we think it does in the galaxy. I'll say more about that, yes. Yes, in a couple slides, um, but maybe not enough. Um, and this view here is a view in our own Milky Way. So um, the, the color represents gas density. The gas is dense here where it's black. And these green contours represent um, gamma rays. So what we think uh, this is showing is cosmic ray nuclei uh, colliding with interstellar particles uh, which, and producing pions, which then decay to uh, photons, among other products. So these molecular clouds are lit up in, in gamma rays. Cosmic rays are very isotropic uh, in their arrival directions. The anisotropy increases with increasing energy but you can see that until we get up to very high energy, so here's approximately the energy of the knee, um, the anisot they're isotropic to better than 1%. But, so that was kind of a canonical piece of lore that cosmic rays are isotropic. But as with anything, if you um, look hard enough, you begin to see cracks in the picture. And it was discovered originally by Tibet and confirmed by other experiments that there are hot and cold spots in the TeV cosmic ray distribution um, at a very small level, well under a hundredth of a percent. And these have proved very difficult to explain theoretically. OK, composition. So cosmic rays are mostly protons, uh, although there's evidence that as we go to higher energies, they're dominated by heavier nuclei. Electrons, as I said, 1 to 2 percent by number. The elemental composition is similar to the solar system except that they're highly enriched in light elements, lithium, beryllium, and boron. And this is assumed to be due to spallation, which allows us to estimate the confinement time in the galaxy. It's about 15 million years. The confinement time decreases with increasing energy. And this has two effects. It steepens the spectrum from the original accelerated spectrum. And the electron spectrum is actually further steepened by energy losses, which are more rapid for electrons than they are for protons. Yes, um, that they're produced somewhere in the galaxy, that they eventually escape by processes which I'll discuss in more detail later, uh, but that on the average, their resonance time in the galaxy is about 15 million years, which is, of course, much larger than the travel time across the galaxy. If we look at other galaxies, um, we see that there's an extremely tight correlation between their far infrared luminosity and their uh, radio luminosity at this 1.49 gigahertz, gigahertz. And this is, this is thought to be, so how do we interpret this? The far infrared is basically a measure of the star formation rate. These far infrared photons are reprocessed by dust, uh, originally ultraviolet from massive stars. 
And the radio is synchrotron radiation, um, which is proportional to the product of magnetic and cosmic ray energy densities. So this appears to hold out to uh, a redshift of two, which is far back in cosmic time to when the universe was only a few hundred million years old. And it suggests that there's some powerful self-regulation mechanism between generation of magnetic fields, acceleration of cosmic rays, and star formation. If we go even further back to cosmic rays through time, um, the oldest halo stars show light elements, which is interpreted as um, due to irradiation in the, of the material from which they formed by, by cosmic rays. So back when the oldest stars in the galaxy formed, there appear to have been cosmic rays. And of course, where there are cosmic rays, there are also magnetic fields. And this is an image showing um, from, from Fermi estimating how much of the gamma ray background is due to point sources and how much of it is diffuse. And cosmic rays from galaxies at high redshift can contribute to this observed gamma ray background. So cosmic rays seem to be an enduring feature of the universe. So to summarize um, these properties, the near interstellar composition implies that the source material is interstellar. And specifically, it's not supernova ejecta. It's more representative interstellar material. Uh, this broken power law spectrum, uh, that must be produced by the acceleration and propagation. The, uh, the near isotropy suggests that the particles are scattered and well trapped by the galactic magnetic field. Um, the long confinement times, uh, the particles diffuse with an energy dependent spectrum that steepens the source spectrum. And these universal magnetic energy density, cosmic ray energy density, and star formation relationships suggest this regulation going on between the star formation, the galactic dynamo, and particle acceleration. Uh, yeah, did, Mark. Did you say the loss, the confinement, the loss of particles through confinement, does, does that steepen the spectrum before the need, or is that the explanation for the need? Excellent. So, um, so the confinement times are not actually measured up to the knee energies, because the confinement times, in order, you have to measure the composition to um, see what the density of spallation products is. And the, the cosmic rays at, you know, at a few PeV, are, there just are not enough of them to measure the composition. So um, that's an open question, whether the, um, it's not obvious, maybe looking at this plot, um, well, well, okay. Uh, maybe this plot suggests something about the propagation. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the disk it's the disk galaxies that show the synchrotron radiation, the gamma ray emission, except for active galaxies. Yeah. Um, so you're getting way ahead of me, but um, so one possible origin of the ultra high energy cosmic rays, the ones that are extragalactic in origin, is active galactic nuclei. And those occur in ellipticals, but they also occur in spirals. Now, uh, there is a problem with active galactic nuclei related to uh, photopion destruction. Uh, so maybe the elliptical galaxies are a more plausible origin. But yeah, I think that's probably not a bad guess. OK, so if we want to understand uh, propagation of cosmic rays, direct numerical simulation of their orbits is not the way to go. Uh, because even if we knew the galactic magnetic field perfectly, uh, there are at least 10 orders of magnitude in its scale of structures, which would be impossible to simulate. And cosmic rays of different energies see uh, magnetic structures of different types. So here's, um, here are length scales in centimeters, which I guess is kind of perverse. And here are, here are gyro radii of cosmic rays of different energies in a microgauss field. And you can see that the young supernova remnants, um, if they're associated with anything, they're associated with, uh, sorry, the three PEV cosmic rays are maybe ex associated with young supernova remnants, sort of a similar characteristic size. TEV, we're going to the heliosphere. Um, and above uh, about 10 
EEV, so an EEV is 10 to the 18 electron volts, the gyro radius is bigger than the galactic disk. So the highest energy cosmic rays cannot be confined by the galaxy. Okay, so since we can't do a brute force uh, integration of particle orbits except in a few, for a few special purposes, we kind of break down uh, the field particle interactions uh, into a few elements. So there's the gyro motion, helically, uh, helical motion around the field lines. There are drifts due to curvature and variation of magnetic field. These tend to be very slow. Uh, the drift velocity of, is of order the particle velocity times the ratio of the gyro radius to the magnetic length scale. Uh, there's mirroring, repulsion from areas of strong field, which may reduce the flux into molecular clouds. There's resonance scattering, which is very important, and I'll describe in a minute. And then there are various forms of collective behavior, instabilities that cosmic rays are able to excite in the medium. So what is gyro resonant pitch angle scattering? So uh, this red here uh, depicts a magnetic field line. It has some large scale curvature and some tiny scale squiggles. And the black is the orbit of a particle. And it basically follows the field, because its gyro radius is very small compared to the large scale curvature and very large compared to the small scale structure, which it basically doesn't even see. Whereas if a particle encounters a, a fluct and a magnetic fluctuation with a wavelength of order its own gyro radius, it interacts with it very strongly. And since I'm in ski country, um, so I have the surfing analogy and the skiing analogy, and the skiing analogy is, so you can ski on a very large scale slope and your skis kind of stay on Earth. And you know a little bit of washboard may shake you up, but your skis also stay on the ground. But it's those, it's those features that are about as far apart as the length of your skis um, that cause a strong interaction. And this is shown here, just an integration of particle orbits, resonant and non-resonant. OK, so we can describe um, this gyro resonant interaction as a scattering process. And we can ask what its effect is on the whole distribution. So now are there going to be a few um, somewhat mathematical slides. So we can describe the evolution of the distribution function due to this scattering uh, by this diffusion-like uh, term. So nu is a scattering frequency. Uh, which is basically the particle gyro radius times the magnetic energy fluctuation uh, at the gyro radius, normalized by the background magnetic field. And mu is the cosine of the particle pitch angle. And this is all measured in the wave frame, which we do because in that frame, there's no energy exchange. The um, scattering is elastic. So we have this scattering. and we can, in the limit that that scattering is very frequent compared to other things, we can derive this convection diffusion equation, which looks long. Um, well, it is long, but we kind of take it apart term by term. So this says that the distribution function is advected at the speed u. And u is the sum of the background plasma velocity plus this kind of weighted mean of the alphane speed. So the magnetic fluctuations travel at the alphane speed. Nu plus refers to uh, waves traveling in the direction of the fluid. Nu minus is counter propagating. So you can see that this, if you have equally balanced fluctuations, the same in both directions, uh, this velocity is 0. Otherwise, it can be positive or negative. So the particles are advected and also compressed or dilated. Uh, depending on what the divergence of u is. So this will cause changes in particle momentum. This is the famous adiabatic deceleration in the solar wind. Then there's spatial diffusion, which is due to both the plus and minus going waves. Um, v squared is just the particle velocity close to the speed of light. That produces spatial diffusion along the magnetic field. And then finally, we have diffusion in momentum space, which depends on having both forward and backward propagating waves present. So if you have waves of only one sign, um, 
the scattering would not produce any um, changes in energy. But when waves of both sign are present, we basically have the Fermi process, the second order Fermi process. OK. So now let's talk about what makes new plus and new minus what they are. So it turns out that gyro-resonant streaming cosmic rays, so this is when the whole cosmic ray distribution is being advected at some speed, which we call the streaming speed, that transfers momentum to waves that are co-propagating, and it absorbs momentum from waves that are counter-propagating relative to the direction of streaming. And specifically, streaming at greater than the alphane speed destabilizes these co-propagating alphane waves and causes them to grow at this rate. So the proton gyro frequency times the ratio of the cosmic ray particle density to the background density times this anisotropy factor divided by the particle gamma. And so under interstellar conditions, this is typically fast, but it is a declining function of energy. Now, in a steady state, something has to balance the growth of the waves. And so three damping mechanisms are important, depending on the circumstances. In partially ionized gas, there's very strong friction between the plasma and the neutrals, and that damps the wave. In a hot gas, a fully ionized gas, there's a nonlinear energy transfer process called nonlinear Landau damping, which can transfer wave energy to the thermal ions. And finally, if the background magnetic field is not perfectly uniform but kind of wanders, these waves can get sheared apart. And that's also described as a damping mechanism. So that's important when small scale turbulence is present. And in a steady state, damping will balance the growth. And that will determine the rate at which cosmic rays can stream, the amplitude of the waves, and the dissipation rate. The streaming anisotropy can be related to the density gradient, so the spatial gradient. The collision frequency, again, plus and minus waves contribute, times this anisotropy factor. And this is a Compton getting factor, uh, which arises when we transform from the wave frame to the lab frame. So this gives rise to the following picture. The cosmic ray density or pressure gradient drives an anisotropy, because particles tend to stream down their gradient. Resonant co-propagating waves absorb the momentum that that the particles transfer to it. And those waves transfer momentum and energy to the background gas through the damping process. So that allows us um, to work with cosmic rays in this fluid approximation, this cosmic ray hydrodynamic approximation. And I'm going to give you two versions of it. So the version I've just described is the one in which cosmic rays generate the waves which dominate their scattering. And in that case, the cosmic rays are advected at the alphane speed relative to the fluid. They also diffuse along the magnetic field, depending on how, what the amplitude of the waves is. Um, and the cosmic ray pressure gradient along the magnetic field accelerates and heats the background gas. So momentum and energy are exchanged with the background gas. But there's more than one source of turbulence in the universe. And if externally driven turbulence dominates, then the cosmic rays still advect with the fluid and diffuse along the magnetic field. But instead of giving energy to the background medium, they take energy from it through the second order Fermi process. So which of these pictures is correct? Um, and that depends on a lot of things. What's the spectrum of interstellar and intergalactic turbulence down to the scales which are relevant for shearing these wave packets apart? And how does the streaming instability work in the presence of the background magnetic turbulence? And is there some damping mechanism for the waves that we haven't identified, that we haven't thought of yet? And this may all seem kind of um, obscure, but the whole nature of the coupling and the direction of the energy flow depend on our answers to these questions. So our current best assessment, taking what we know, is that below somewhere between 1 and 200 GeV, the cosmic rays are self-confined. So they are the primary source of the turbulence which scatters them. But because the, uh, the ability to excite these waves declines with increasing cosmic ray energy, the more energetic cosmic rays are confined by extrinsic turbulence. And the, the turnover occurs somewhere 
you know, at the top of this energy range. Then as we go to still higher energies, maybe 10 to 100 TeV, this diffusion picture begins to break down because the mean free paths for the cosmic rays are getting longer and longer. And then as we go uh, past an EeV, the galactic confinement picture begins to break down. So there seems to be this transition in regimes. So what are the implications of self-confinement? So if the crossover from self-confined to externally confined or ex extrinsically confined cosmic ray uh, occurs at 100 to 200 GeV, then, that, then most of the pressure is there to be transferred to the stellar medium. And under those conditions, uh, the cosmic rays provide hydrostatic support to the galactic disk. Uh, they tend to be buoyant because there's very little mass density in them. They can drive escape of the galactic magnetic field, which is a key process for the galactic dynamo, just as it seems to be on the sun. Um, the cosmic ray pressure gradient can drive a galactic wind. Um, through pressure and heating, uh, cosmic rays can con uh, drive a convective instability. They can actually heat the gas measurably. And finally, they can modify collisionless shocks. And I don't have time to talk about all these applications, but I'll just mention two of them. Uh, so one is the galactic wind. So in the early 1990s, it was discovered that soft X-rays come from the inner galaxy. And attempts to model this as a static, uh, hydrostatically confined structure were only partially successful. And it turns out that a wind driven by a combination of the gas pressure and cosmic ray pressure does a much better job. So this is the result of a parameter study varying the cosmic ray and thermal gas pressure. The color represents the mass loss in solar masses per year, so the galactic wind loses mass, the galaxy loses mass much more rapidly than the sun uh, by 13 orders of magnitude or so. Um, and the best fit is somewhere over here where thermal and uh, cosmic ray pressures play comparable roles. If you take away the cosmic ray pressure, there's not enough gas pressure to drive the wind. Cosmic rays also make a difference in the temperature structure of the wind. So without cosmic ray heating, the, the temperature just kind of drops like a stone because of adiabatic expansion. But if we add in the cosmic rays, we can keep the wind hot, not indefinitely, uh, but we can drive quite a large temperature difference uh, pretty far out. This is an image of our galaxy in H alpha, uh, taken with the WAM uh, telescope. So H alpha is produced by recombining hydrogen. So it's a signature of ionized gas. Um, this curve here represents the, the temperature of the gas above a spiral arm. Um, the standard model of the heating of this gas is um, photoelectric heating by hot stars in the galactic disk. And that never quite did it. But when we add in cosmic ray pressure, uh, we can get quite good agreement. So cosmic ray, collisionless cosmic ray heating may be an important source of pressure, or of heat, sorry, of heating for the ionized gas layer. What is the scale of that picture? Um, it's a few kiloparsecs. So the ionized gas layer, um, the half thickness is about one and a half kiloparsecs. Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. So um, the the heating occurs. Um, the heating is due to streaming along the magnetic field. So the magnetic field has to have a vertical component for this type of heating to work. Horizontal gradients will not do it. Very good question. Okay, so let me say a little bit about the origin of cosmic rays. So Fermi showed from very general arguments and um, if you want to read a beautiful short paper written in 1949, um, I recommend you read his paper. It's a great paper. He showed that um, you can get a power law energy spectrum. And the index of the power law is 1 plus the ratio of the acceleration time to the escape or confinement time of particles in the acceleration region. 
So this makes sense. Um, if the escape time is very short, the spectrum is very steep. Very few particles get to high energies. Uh, if the acceleration time is much shorter than the escape time, the spectrum is very hard. And Fermi left those times as free parameters. He didn't know what they were. So um, we can apply those rules to a couple of um, acceleration models. So this is a cartoon of what's probably the leading candidate for acceleration of galactic cosmic rays. So this is a shock, um, this line, probably driven by a supernova. Um, here's a real supernova remnant. And um, here are magnetic field lines going kind of perpendicular to the shock. And they have irregularities on them. Sitting in the shock frame, fluid comes into the, sh into the shock at a very high velocity and leaves at a slower velocity. So a particle which is scattered across the shock in this direction has an overtaking collision. It loses a little bit of energy. But if it bounces back, it has a head-on collision with something moving much faster. And so there's a net energy gain per loop. And you can show that the ratio of the acceleration time to the escape time is about 1 in this process, which means that the natural uh, energy spectrum of shock acceleration is an e to the minus 2 spectrum which, if you add in a little bit of steepening due to propagation, is very close to what we see. This, this X-ray image of the young supernova remnant RCW86 um, is maybe partial confirmation of this picture. These very thin rims here represent X-ray energies, uh, synchrotron radiation, from ultra-high energy electrons that have probably been accelerated in this shock front. Magnetic reconnection is also an interesting mechanism for acceleration. So magnetic reconnection, um, especially when the current sheets that are reconnecting break up, can form these, um, these isolated structures called plasmoids. And these plasmoids, due to their magnetic tension, tend to shrink. And so the particles are trapped in these shrinking magnetic islands, and they gain energy. Um, and here are two energy spectra uh, taken initially and then at later times showing how a distribution of test particles in one of these reconnection simulations uh, becomes a power law spectrum which flattens with time. And this may give us a fast acceleration mechanism uh, for flares. So I want to switch now and, and talk, go into a little depth about diffusion and propagation. And what I specifically want to talk about is how particles cross magnetic fields. And this is motivated by um, a couple of things which have not yet been addressed in propagation theory. So in everything I've said so far, we've kind of split the magnetic field into a perfectly uniform part and then tiny scale structures superimposed on it, which provides scattering. But in reality, magnetic fields have structure on, on all scales. And so we're going to look at um, what happens when the field lines wander within a gyro orbit, when particles are scattered as well as uh, subject to field line wandering. And this we're not going to get to, uh, but it's an important future application. So, in many cosmic ray galactic propagation codes, diffusion is uh, treated as a tensor. There's diffusion parallel to the field, and there's diffusion perpendicular to the field. And what they really mean is not per diffusion perpendicular to the exact field, but perpendicular to the mean field, which is parallel to the plane of the galaxy. So if we have uh, two field lines, and a particle stays on one field line, but that field line is moving to uh, the left, that particle is said to be horizontally diffusing. But a particle could actually move to another field line like this. It could come in on this field line, these two field lines get near each other, and then it leaves on the other field line. So it's interesting to know whether particles really cross field lines or whether they only go where the field lines go. So we decided, even though um, Realistic integration of test particle orbits is impossible. We decided to do some kind of simple tests. 
And we wanted to separate out this business of field line wandering from particle wandering. So we chose some very simple magnetic field lines that have a bounded horizontal displacement. They don't go wandering off to who knows where. And we decided to look at the joint effects of magnetic geometry and pitch angle scattering, which didn't seem to have been done. So here are our magnetic field models. So we did a uniform field, not fun to draw. We did a, what we call a cellular magnetic field. So there's a very strong component of magnetic field um, heading out of the board toward you. And then the projection of the field lines on the horizontal plane has this simple cellular structure. So the field lines are helices. And then we tried a magnetic field which has another, which also has a cellular structure. But it's a cellular structure which wags back and forth. And this magnetic field, or the flow analogous to this magnetic field, um, was shown long ago uh, by Dave Galloway and Mike Proctor to uh, chaotically mix particles and amplify magnetic fields uh, exponentially fast. So we decided to see if it would, a field like this would also be good at diffusing particles. So um, how, do you, how do you analyze this? You define a running diffusion tensor which represents, so if you have n particles, this is a sum over all the particles, um, the, dij, the ijth component of the tensor is the displacement of the particle from its initial position in that i coordinate times the displacement in the, from the initial position in the j coordinate divided by time. Now, um, if you're sharp, and I know you are, um, you know that this isn't really cross-field diffusion. This is spatial diffusion. So we can correct it for cross-field motion by finding the position of the gyrocenter and subtracting the uh, position of the gyrocenter. This is supposed to be a unit vector. Subtracting the position of the gyrocenter from the position of the field line when the particle gets to that height. And then we have this corrected running diffusion tensor. OK. So what happens if we propagate particles in a uniform magnetic field uh, subject to pitch angle scattering? So initially, their parallel running diffusion tensor increases. This represents ballistic motion. And then as they start to scatter, it flattens out. So the diffusion coefficient converges to um, a fixed asymptotic value that turns out to be very well predicted by the old so-called quasi-linear theory of diffusion. So this checks out nicely. What happens for perpendicular diffusion? Well, initially, the running diffusion coefficient goes down. And that's because the particles mostly are just gyrating around their field line. So their displacement is limited by their gyro radius. And meanwhile, their, the diffusion coefficient is being divided by time, which is going down. So you get this plunge. But then eventually, there's a little bit of cross-field line scattering. And this also levels out to um, something that's very well predicted by the standard theory. And notice how hugely different these parallel and perpendicular diffusion coefficients are. So for example, for so p caret means the momentum in units of mc. So say choose this one. Uh, so it's between 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7 in the parallel direction and between 10 to the minus 6 and 10 to the minus 5 in the perpendicular direction. So in a uniform field, particles really have trouble crossing magnetic field lines. So how do we do in these slightly more complicated fields? So here's what happens in the cellular magnetic field. So this is, so notice that this scale is multiplied by 10. So this is going from 0 to 3,000, uh, 0 to 3,000. These cells are 100 in the same units. So the color represents time. So we start in blue. So particles kind of hang out in a single cell for a while, uh, shown by their, up in their helical motion. But then they transition to um, another cell. And then they transition to another cell. And uh, they're definitely migrating across the field. And in the Galloway-Proctor uh, model, this is even more pronounced. So this is a different scale. This is also times, um, no, this is times, uh, sorry, 100. And we're going out to 800. So the particles are really uh, 
you know, they'll be trapped for a little while, but they're crossing field lines very, very efficiently. So what do the running diffusion coefficients look like? So the, the dash lines are similar to what you saw before. And this increase here is kind of the ballistic phase. This is the particles um, undergoing horizontal transport as they migrate around a cell. But eventually, uh, the dashed and solid lines converge to a fixed value. So this is the p equals 10 case. Remember, the diffusion coefficient was about 10 to the minus 6. For a uniform field, it's 10 to the minus 3 in this particular case. So the cross-field diffusion is definitely enhanced. And to kind of summarize a lot of test runs, these are the diffusion coefficients in a whole bunch of different cases. And we found, this is perpendicular diffusion, we found that they're, that they're bounded below and above. They're bounded below by the value for a uniform magnetic field. So these are the tiny uniform field cases. And they're bounded above by something like the, the eddy diffusivity. So this is the square of the size of the cell times the time it takes a particle to go around. So this is kind of the maximum rate of transport. The particle um, goes around a helix, and in the time it goes around the helix, it scoots over to the next cell. So it's kind of like percolation. Goes around a cell, uh, then transfers to another cell. You can see that the chaotic Galloway-Proctor field uh, comes very close to the ballistic limit. And the cellular case is somewhere in between. These lower limits here are when it never actually uh, converged to diffusion. So these perpendicular diffusivities um, are still small compared to the parallel diffusivities, but they're much, much larger. So even simple magnetic geometry without a whole lot of chaos makes it easy for particles to cross, or easier for particles to cross magnetic fields. Now, I want to uh, say a little bit about a synergism with laboratory studies, which are interesting for laboratory plasmas, but I think they have something to contribute to natural plasma energetic particle studies. So here is evidence for ion heating in a so-called reverse pinch plasma. So this is an alternative fusion device. It's toroidal. Um, I won't describe it in a lot of detail. Um, it undergoes periodic strong magnetic reconnection events called sawtooth crashes. And as I'll show you in a minute, um, there's strong ion heating in these sawtooth crashes. So here are some features of the heating. It's very anisotropic. So the perpendicular temperature is increased more than the parallel temperature. There's a charge to mass dependence. And the majority ions develop a high energy tail, non-Maxwellian tail. So here's a little more detail about what this looks like. So as this is time in milliseconds. Uh, zero is the reconnection event. So the magnetic energy is slowly increasing. Then it undergoes this fairly large crash, 20 kilojoules. Uh, and then it plateaus over to here. And coincident with that, the ions um, have a spike in their temperature. They're uh, heated by about a factor of three, and then the temperature slowly decays. What happens to the electrons um, is a bit of a puzzle. We're actually working on it now. So to look at this image, uh, you would think that the electrons are not heated, but actually cooled. This is probably due to uh, the very poor electron confinement. So the electrons may well be being heated, but the heated electrons are crashing into the wall of the device. And this may actually get easier during the sawtooth crash when the magnetic field becomes more stochastic. So we're actually trying to study um, what happens to the electrons in more detail now through modeling uh, to see whether they can be undergoing heating too. Um, here is their anisotropy. Uh, so the perpendicular temperature uh, rises much more than the parallel temperature, shown in red. The parallel temperature is roughly constant. Um, we, there's an ex, there's a can be modeled here, but um, 
doesn't mean it's, we understand it. Um, here's, the, here's what happens to impurity ions. Uh, this, I think, is reminiscent to what happens in some space plasmas, including the solar wind. Um, there's a model in which they're heated by ion cyclotron waves, but it's not definitive. And then finally, uh, so this was a fairly new observation. Um, for years and years, they talked about ion heating, uh, but there's a power law tail, which is also observed. And the spectral index uh, really flattens, the spectrum really flattens following the reconnection event. So in addition to energization, we can study propagation. So this is uh, the Torpex plasma. It has a toroidal magnetic field initially, which is unstable, develops fluctuations. And by studying how particles propagate in those fluctuations, we can gain some insight into this diffusion process, including cross-field diffusion. Oh, OK. So we've reached the summary. So the observations of cosmic rays, the long confinement time, the near isotropy, led to this theory, which was actually developed in the late 60s initially, for how cosmic rays could, could couple to the background medium. And since that time, more and more applications of this coupling have been found. But it's not the only way things could be. We saw that if cosmic rays don't confine themselves, but are combined by extrinsic turbulence, um, they don't transfer energy and momentum to the background medium. So this remains a compelling problem. I think this is a great time to be studying cosmic rays. There's a whole lot of new data from new experiments. Um, we're understanding magnetic turbulence better, always a work in progress. Um, we have lab experiments. We have observations, theory, and simulations. So maybe the prospects are good for reaching our goals, which again are to understand how the cosmic ray energy budget and spectrum and composition are regulated. Um, we need to improve the theory of cosmic ray hydrodynamics to uh, treat magnetized turbulence more realistically. And then, as, you know, as we trust the theory more and more, we can include it in uh, other theories of astrophysical plasma processes like shocks, magnetic reconnection, and dynamos. So um, thank you. I'll take questions. For Alan? Hi, Art. Um, there's something that I, I'm not sure if I followed entirely. The, the cosmic rays interact with the magnetic field fluctuations. Well, I guess alpha N waves or, or yeah. MHD waves. Yeah. And tend to produce sort of an energy equipartition. Is it with the waves or with the background field or both? With it. So no, that's an interesting point. So the waves um, are very, very tiny amplitude. You can explain the cosmic ray confinement time if the, if the amplitude of the waves is only 10 to the minus 3. So delta V over V of 10 to the minus 3 is enough to confine cosmic rays to the galaxy. So the waves, and in fact the background magnetic field, are only kind of a conduit that allow the cosmic rays to transfer their energy to the, the background, the background gas. Now, I haven't really addressed why the background magnetic field and the cosmic rays are close to equipartition, as they're observed to be. And that is not a solved problem. Yes, so this scattering isotropizes, yes, it isotropizes the particles. I have, I have basically two questions. Could you, first of all, address what occurs during the confinement? Are you just constantly scattering it and keeping the cosmic rays, say, within the galaxy? So um, for the most part, yes, but let me say a little bit more about that. So from the, from the light elements, we have some idea of um, how much matter the cosmic rays go through. And if you use the mean interstellar density, 
you come up with, um, it's three to five grams of matter, it's about three million years. But there's, um, there's evidence from a radioactive isotope <coughs> expellation process, I think it's beryllium 10, that, that the actual residence time is more like 15 million years, which means that the average density that the particles sample is less than the average interstellar density, which implies that they're spending some of their time in the galactic halo. Now, this is not implausible because the synchrotron thickness of the galaxy, uh, or the half thickness, is about one and a half kiloparsecs, whereas most of the gas is at a couple of hundred parsecs. So the cosmic rays seem to live in this thick disk. And then, how do they get out? Do they get out? Do they carry the field with them? Do they scatter across the field lines? Um, important question. We don't know the answer. Thank you. My second question is, like a, somebody who lives on the Earth, could you tell us what are all the implications of cosmic rays on, on essentially processes in our planet, besides being a nuisance when you try to measure neutrinos or um, they, they are a nuisance. So, um, so the whole question of how cosmic rays propagate within the heliosphere is, um, so some of the theory that I've described was actually to first apply to heliospheric propagation, not to galactic propagation. Um, if the Earth had no magnetic field, then, you know, in addition to solar, if the Earth and the Sun had no magnetic field, of course, we'd be bombarded by the naked flux. But there's very strong modulation that keeps the cosmic rays at bay. But they're an important source of, um, of ionization. They're, and they're an important energy source, the, the lower energy ones that get in to the upper atmosphere. But I think there are people here who know much more about that than I do. So I, hi, Ellen. Uh, I gathered from your talk that there are scales for cosmic ray of given energy where sort of it feels the background structure and the background field and it can either draw energy from it or pass energy on. That, that brought me to this uh, back to this picture a few years ago when the first real high resolution pictures of uh, large interstellar clouds became uh, available. One of the surprising results was that there appears to be much more turbulence in them in the small scales than people uh, expected and there was a lot of speculation why that is uh, the case, how this turbulence is being initiated in the first place. Do those scales at all relate to uh, cosmic ray scales? Yeah, so, the, so the, the question of cosmic rays and clouds is, is an interesting one because these, these clouds tend to be only partially ionized. And therefore, the waves, the, the fluctuations which scatter the cosmic rays um, undergo very strong damping by ion neutral friction. Um, and I actually re examined this a couple of years ago with a postdoc. Um, you basically, I think the cosmic rays just kind of stream right through um, those clouds and are probably not. So, um, so I think the whole picture of what happens to a turbulent cascade in a partially ionized medium as you approach the ion neutral decoupling scale is a complicated, is a complicated one. Um, the turbulence uh, may be able to survive in the neutrals uh, because the neutral damping scale is very short. Um, there's beginning to be some evidence for differences in the ion and neutral turbulence spectra. Um, from observing line widths of ionized and neutral species in molecular clouds. Um, but I think the, you know, the general question of whether cosmic rays can energize interstellar turbulence um, is maybe most important near supernova remnants. Uh, there are actually, I didn't have time to talk about it, but um, there are 
very powerful instabilities, much more powerful than the uh, resonant instability, which I described, which um, when you have a very high flux of cosmic rays, which, which can drive very large amplitude magnetic turbulence and ac actually amplify the magnetic field, although the amplification seems to be on very small scale. I have a quick question. So uh, you mentioned the con convection and diffusion equation, yeah. and there's a adiabatic term there. Yeah. That will will that always lead to energy loss, or it could be also energy gain? It depends on what the divergence of V is. Right. So if 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 the flow is converging, energy gain. If the flow is expanding, energy loss. Yeah, because in literature, I seem to read that they always refer to that as a, a adiabatic energy loss. So I, I think, you know, in an expanding flow like the solar wind, uh -huh. so uh -huh. um, if you're talking about particles that are trapped in the solar wind, um, they do undergo adiabatic deceleration because of the expansive nature of the flow. But in a shock, you know, you have converging flow, and then that actually gives you energization. Oh, no more questions. Let's thank Alan again. <laughs>